It's August 1819. You're 16 years old and you've just been hired as a deckhand on your first sea voyage. You're preparing for the adventure of your life, but little do you know that you and your crew will soon be stranded at sea, forced to eat each other to survive. The 87-foot-long, 240-ton whaling ship Essex is leaving today for a two-year, 10,000-mile journey to hunt sperm whales. You grew up on the island of Nantucket, the hub of the thriving whale oil trade, so you've always known you would go into the whaling business like everyone else in your life. As the ship pulls away from port, you stand on the deck and wave goodbye to your family. You can't believe that it'll be two years until you see them again, but at least you'll be a sea-tested sailor when you return. Only two days after setting sail, you get your first taste of the sea's wrath when a fierce storm comes out of nowhere and nearly sinks the ship. After making some repairs, you continue on your journey down the eastern coast of South America, and five weeks later, the Essex arrives in Cape Horn off the southern tip of South America. To you, it feels like you've sailed to the bottom of the world. Unfortunately, the delay from the storm means you arrived late and you find that the usually fertile hunting waters have been fished out. The captain decides to head toward the Galapagos Islands in the South Pacific in search of whales. After a long trip up the other side of South America, the crew anchors at Charles Island in the Galapagos to restock, where bad luck continues to plague your excursion. A reckless crew member's prank burns the entire island to the ground. You run through the flames and barely escape with your life. Thankfully, no one in the crew is hurt, but the same can't be said for the island's wildlife. You're now responsible for the extinction of the Floriana tortoise and the near extinction of the Floriana mockingbird. Finally, after more than a year at sea, your crew encounters a group of sperm whales. It looks like luck is finally in your favor, or so you think. The experienced crew jumps into action, immediately launching three of the ship's 20-foot whaling boats crewed by six men each. Soon enough, two of the three whaling boats have successfully harpooned whales. No easy feat, since this involves rowing incredibly close to the whale so one man can harpoon it, then holding on for dear life while you try stabbing it to death with a lance. The third boat was not so lucky. It got too close to a whale and was damaged by the powerful beast. As the two successful boats are carried away by the panicking whales in what's called a Nantucket sleigh ride, the third crew returns to the ship, where you, as a lowly deckhand, had to stay during the hunt. As the first mate is angrily repairing his boat, you look out and spot the biggest sperm whale you've ever laid eyes on. It's a true monster, probably 85 feet long and weighing 80 tons. The whale is acting strange though. It's floating still in the sea, spraying water from its spout, and seems to be watching you. You shout out as it starts to swim directly toward the boat, traveling at a speed of around three knots. The first mate grabs a lance and takes careful aim, but hesitates, worried about angering the beast and it damaging the ship. You pray that it'll dive, but your prayers go unanswered. The giant whale smashes head first into the side of the ship so hard you're knocked off your feet. As water pours in through a hole in the port side and the crew scrambles to get pumps going, you can see that the whale is still there and it looks enraged, rolling in the water and snapping its jaws. Again, it turns and barrels toward the ship, traveling at six knots now as its 12-foot-wide tail pumps furiously, leaving a 40-foot wake. The crew frantically tries to maneuver the ship out of the whale's path, but it's too late. The whale once again smashes into the ship head first, this time hitting the ship just below the anchor. The ship gets lodged on the beast's head as the whale pushes the ship sideways through the water and water pours over the transom. Finally, the whale disentangles itself from the wreckage and dives, disappearing for good, but the ship is destroyed. The crew scrambles to lower the last spare whaling boat and fill it with as much food, fresh water, and navigational equipment as possible. When the whaling boats notice that the Essex has disappeared, they immediately cut loose their valuable whales and head back to where they last saw the ship. The first whaling boat to arrive is one led by the captain. As he arrives on the scene to find his majestic ship floundering, the captain turns to the first mate and asks, My God, Mr. Chase, what's the matter? Mr. Chase, the first mate, can only reply, We've been stoved by a whale. You spend that night in the whaling boats tied to the wreckage, but by morning you all know 
know that you need a plan. You're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, about as far from land as you can possibly be. You are 20 men and you have only three small whaling boats, and you only manage to save 60 days worth of provisions from the wreck. The crew quickly vetoes the captain's plan to head to the Society Islands a few hundred miles away, or to the Marquesas Islands 1500 miles away because they had heard rumors of cannibals living on those islands. The irony of this wouldn't be apparent until much later. Instead, it's decided that you'll head south, toward the South American mainland. You figure it'll take about 60 days to reach Chile or Peru, and at least you might be spotted by other whaling ships on the way. Each boat is loaded with 200 pounds of hardtack, a type of dried bread, 65 gallons of water, and one gun. Now that you have a plan and are headed towards land, you and the crew are in much higher spirits, believing the worst is behind you, but you have no idea what's in store for you. Within a few short days, those high spirits are broken. The human body needs a half a pint of water per day just to eliminate waste, and you've had less than half that amount. As you chew your hard bread and bemoan your parched throats, it dawns on you. All the food you managed to save has been soaked in seawater, and as the water evaporated it left behind salt, accelerating your dehydration. To add insult to injury, your boat is attacked again, this time by an aggressive killer whale. Thankfully, you escaped unscathed, but morale is low and getting lower by the minute. After 17 days at sea, a storm hits, gale-forced winds gust at 45 knots, lightning flashes all around you, and immense 40-foot-high waves toss the boat like toys. But by your 23rd day at sea, you begin to pray for a storm, when you find yourself stuck in a dead calm with no wind for days. The captain tries to rally a last-ditch effort and convinces you to row to freedom, but the effort is quickly abandoned as men start to collapse within minutes. You've traveled 1,100 miles, but you're still 5,000 miles from land. You are delirious with thirst, burned raw from the sun, and are rapidly running out of food. You're in an area of the Pacific with no marine life near the surface, so you can't even hope to catch fish. You reach Henderson Island two weeks later, but it's barren. Still, three men refuse to get back in the boats, and you leave them behind on the island when you resume your mission, assuming that they're dead men. Ironically, they would be rescued three months later and would end up being the lucky ones. One week later, the first man dies. He was ill before the shipwreck, so it was not unexpected, but it's still a blow to morale. The men tie a rock to his feet and slip the body overboard in traditional sea burial. Two nights later, the boat led by first mate Chase gets separated from the group. As the two remaining boats divide up what's left of the provisions, you realize that there is less than a pound of hardtack left to share between ten men. A few days later, when the second man dies, you all hesitate about giving him a burial at sea. No one wants to say what you're all thinking. Without food, you will all surely die, and the obvious solution is right there in front of you. You can hardly believe your eyes as you watch one of the most hardened crew members butcher the body of your fellow sailor. First he separates the limbs from the body, then all the flesh is cut from the bones. The heart is removed and the body is sewn back up and committed to the sea as decently as possible under the circumstances. Finally, the meat and organs are roasted on a flat stone at the bottom of the boat and you have the first taste of fresh meat in months. The average human body has about 60 pounds of edible meat, but your starving friend provided less than 30 pounds of very lean meat. Even still, once you've tasted fresh meat again, you can't seem to stop thinking about it. Satisfying your hunger seems to have reawoken it with a vengeance. After nine weeks adrift in the sea, the men in your boat realize that you would all die without food, and someone suggests you all draw lots to determine who will be eaten next. You know this is an old custom at sea, but you had hoped to never live to see it. The lot falls to young Owen Coffin and you begin to sweat. Owen is the captain's nephew. Surely he won't let him be eaten. And who better to take his place than you, the youngest and newest member of the crew? To your great relief, young Owen takes his fate heroically. One of his friends kills and butchers him, and you and the others feast again. Over the coming weeks, three more men would die and be eaten. After a miserable 89 days at sea, three men left clinging to life in First Mate Chase's boat spot a sail on the horizon. They muster the last of their energy and chase down an English ship, the Indian, and are finally miraculously rescued. The third boat will be found years later with three skeletons inside, among many other scattered bones that show signs of having been gnawed on. But your ordeal is not yet over. You and the captain are the last two men left alive and still 1,500 miles from Chile. When a ship pulls up alongside your boat, you're so delirious that you don't understand that these people are trying to help you. You're like a starved, feral dog, hoarding and protecting the last of the bones of your departed crewmates and trying to suck the marrow from them. 
As the ship makes its way to shore, you take time to rest and recover. Although you hear that the captain recovered rather quickly and has been dining in style with the captain of the ship and regaling him with stories of your adventure, you're reunited with the other three survivors in Valparaiso, and by the end of the summer, nearly two years since you left, you're all safely back in Nantucket. You know that cannibalism at sea is customary when men are faced with certain death, but it's still a relief to be welcomed back to your community without judgment. You do hear, though, that the captain wasn't so lucky his sister can't forgive him for eating his nephew, her son. Despite this harrowing ordeal, within a few years you and every one of the other four survivors will return to sea. And in 1851, a man named Herman Melville will publish a novel inspired by the story of the men of the Essex who were stranded at sea, forced to eat each other. It wasn't very popular at the time, but Moby Dick has gone down in literary history. Now go watch the harrowing tale titled I Was Lost at Sea for 76 Days with Sharks Circling. Or maybe you'll like this other video.